Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to St. Andrews on this uh, eighth day of September, whether you're here in person or joining us online, we welcome you to God's glorious day. Um, please take note of the announcements that are in the bulletin. Uh, there are a few more than what I am about to highlight. All of them deserve your attention. Care notes talking with your kids about bullying. Whether the child in your life is the bully or the one being bullied, there are things that he or she needs to learn about this all too common experience. This booklet offers tips for parents, grandparents, on how to communicate with their child or grandchild and form a plan to avoid and overcome the effects of bullying. This book and two others are available in the foyer. Take one, read it, and pass it on. Grocery and restaurant gift cards. They are available for sale after the service. Um, it's a little late to tell you they were available before the service too. <laughs> if you wish to purchase gift cards during the week, contact Rosemary to arrange a time to collect them at Collier United. You can also complete an e-transfer to mail at standrewsberry.ca. That's mail, M-A-I-L at standrewsberry.ca, and we will have the cards ready for you to pick up on Sunday. Or again, you can call the church office at, write this down, 705-728-3991 to make arrangements for pickup during office hours. Do you need a ride to the service on Sunday mornings? Is there anyone willing to pick them up? There are two sign-up sheets at the back of the room, one for those needing rides and one for those volunteering to drive. If you are watching from home and would like to be here in person, call Rosemary during office hours to get your name on the list. It won't help if you phone on Saturday or Sunday morning because she won't get it till Monday. So phone before the weekend and then we will see you here next Sunday. Those are our announcements. We would now like to uh, listen to our prelude presented by Ann Arxey uh, as we prepare for worship the aptly titled Sweet Hour of Prayer.
Good morning. Good morning. For some people, this is your type of weather, right? 10 degrees? Yes. At this time, please turn to your neighbor, and what I'd like you to ask is, where do you see God's power changing things around you? Where do you see God's power changing things around you? I steal your sermon. <laughs> Our call to worship. <clears throat> Put your confidence in God. We have God as our helper, and so we rejoice. God gives justice to the oppressed and food to the hungry. God frees the prisoners and opens the eyes of the blind. So put your trust in God's goodness. May God's goodness endure forever. Let us worship God. Thank you, David. Let us join our voices singing our opening hymn, Praise to the Lord the Almighty, hymn 321. Let us come together for the prayers of adoration and confession, followed by the Lord's Prayer. Let us pray. Eternal God, you are our beginning and our end. 
you gave breath to all living things. By your spirit, you come among us this day, breathing new life into our familiar patterns as a gift you offer us through Christ Jesus. By your grace, you open new possibilities for the world you love. God of mercy, you keep an eye out for those who dwell on the margins of life. We confess we fail to keep our eyes open for those on the margins. We have been silent when we should have spoken up in the face of injustice. Our generosities to others does not match what you offer us. Forgive us for thinking of ourselves first. Renew our commitment to show others the kindness we meet in Jesus Christ. Gracious God, we thank you for hearing our prayers as we stand in awe of your majesty and love. We are humbled by your mercy and forgiveness. Cleanse our hearts and renew our spirits so that we may walk in your light and live according to your will. Strengthen us to reflect your grace in all we do and help us to be faithful witness of your love in this world. And now with confidence as your children, we pray together the words our Savior taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. <laughs> Friends, beloved in Christ, there is no barrier too great for God's love to overcome. In Jesus, every wall that separates us from God and one another has been torn down. Our sins, our failures, our divisions, none of these can stand against the power of Christ's redeeming grace. Know this, in Christ we are reconciled, restored, and renewed. We are forgiven, and nothing can separate us from the love of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Now I invite, at this time, the choir. <clears throat> everyone back again and uh, to start the choir numbers off for this year we've got a fun little number that I was introduced to uh, by the choir last year and it's called unto thee O Lord and they told me it was a camp song so many of you may know it and so what we're going to do is sing the first verse by the choir themselves so they get the tune and then you're welcome to join in you can join the melody if you like the melody, or you can do the echo part, which the men are doing the echo part. So, your choice. Thank you. 
Good morning, everyone. I wanted to talk about the theme of, of love this morning and love, God's love, and also love in our lives and how we experience love. So I want you to imagine something for a second. Imagine the biggest love you've ever felt. Maybe that was from a parent or a grandparent, a best friend or even a pet. Picture that love like a warm hug, something that makes you feel safe and accepted. Now here's the crazy part. God's love is way bigger than that. In fact, in the Bible, Ephesians uh, 3.18 talks about how God's love is so wide, long, high, and deep that it's impossible to fully understand. It's like trying to measure the ocean with a tiny measuring cup. The ocean is way too big, right? And that's exactly how God's love is. Endless, overflowing, and always there for you no matter what. But here's the thing, sometimes we don't feel like we're worthy of that love. We might feel like we've messed up too much we, or that we're not good enough. But in Romans uh, chapter 8, verses 38 to 39, tells us that nothing, absolutely nothing, can separate us from the love of God. Not mistakes, not failures, and not our bad days. Imagine if we lived life every single day like we really believed that, like God's love was always with us, cheering us on, helping us through the tough stuff. How different might our lives look? But the coolest part is that God doesn't just love you from a distance. He showed his love in the most real way possible by sending his son Jesus to die for us. And that's not just words, that's action. That's love that says, I'll do whatever it takes for you. So next time that you feel alone or unloved, remember that God's love is bigger than any love you've ever experienced. It's real, it's constant, and it's for you. Let's pray together. God, thank you for loving us in ways we can't even understand. Help us to feel your love every day and to share that love with others. In your name we pray. Amen. I now invite the youth to join me for our time. Today's Old Testament scripture reading is Isaiah chapter 35, verses 4 through 7a. For those of you in, uh, using the Pew Bibles, that's on page 663, or in the large print Bible, uh, 662. This is Isaiah chapter 35, verses 45 to 7a. Say to those who are of a fearful heart, be strong, do not fear. Here is your God. He will come with vengeance, with terrible recompense. He will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then the lame shall leap like a deer and the tongue of the speechless sing for joy. For water shall break forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. The burning sand shall become a pool and the thirsty grounds of water. The haunt of jackals shall become a swamp. The grass shall become reeds and rushes. Our psalm reading is 146, Psalm 146, and we will read it responsively. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O my soul. I will praise the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praises to my God all my life long. Do not put your trust in princes, in mortals, in whom there is no help. When their breath departs, if they return to the earth, on that very day their plans perish. Happy are those whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord their God. Who made heaven and earth. Who executes justice for the oppressed, who gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets the prisoners free. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the strangers. He upholds the orphan and the widow. But the way of the wicked he brings to ruin. The Lord will reign forever. Your God will for all generations, praise the Lord. 
Our New Testament reading is from Mark chapter 7, verses 24 to 37. Again, in the uh, Pew Bibles, page 42, in the New Testament, and the large print Bibles, page 37. That is Mark chapter 7, verses 24 to 37. From there he set out and went away to the region of Tyre. He entered a house and did not want anyone to know he was there, yet he could not escape notice. But a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit immediately heard about him, and she came and bowed down at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile of Syrophesian origin. She begged him to cast the demon out of her daughter. He said to her, let the children be fed first, for it is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. But she answered him, Sir, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Then he said to her, For saying that, you may go. The demon has left your daughter. So she went home, found the child lying on the bed, and the demon gone. Then he returned from the region of Tyre and went by the way of Sidon towards the Sea of Galilee in the region of the Decapolis. They brought to him a deaf man who had an impediment in his speech, and they begged him to lay his hand on him. He took him aside in private, away from the crowd, and put his fingers into his ears, and he spat and touched his tongue. Then looking up to heaven, he sighed and said to him, Ephephrath, that is, be opened. And immediately his ears were opened, his tongue was released, and he spoke plainly. Then Jesus ordered them to tell no one, but the more he ordered them, the more zealously they proclaimed it. They shouted beyond measure, saying, He has done everything well. He even makes the deaf to hear and the mute to speak. May God add to our understanding the reading of his holy word. Let us join our voices singing our next hymn, Lord of All Hopelessness, hymn 748. <laughs> seated. 
Let us pray. Gracious God, as we gather in your presence, may your spirit move among us, guiding our thoughts and softening our hearts to hear your truth. Speak to us, Lord, that we may be transformed by your message and leave this place renewed in faith, hope, and love. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. So, at times... Our lives can feel dry and lifeless, as if we're stuck in place with no way forward. Grief, especially from losing someone we love, can take away our energy and joy, leaving us feeling empty and worn down. In these moments, it's easy to feel as though life has lost its spark, so to speak leaving us longing for a sense of renewal. Yet, this state, you see, is not permanent. As people of faith and followers of Jesus, we hold on to the promise that God will bring life back into our dry and barren places. Just as the prophet Isaiah said, God will restore us turning our deserts into fertile ground. He brings streams to the wasteland, reviving our spirits, renewing our strength, and transforming our sorrow into joy and hope. The people of Judah during the time of Isaiah were facing immense pressure and fear from foreign powers, particularly the Assyrian Empire, which had already conquered the northern kingdom of Israel. Their suffering, according to biblical scholar Michael Chan, says, is manifested in weak hands, feeble knees, fearful hearts, obscured vision, hindering hearing, broken bodies, and silent tongues, as noted in our reading from Isaiah. In the preceding chapter, though, the prophet Isaiah warned the people of impending destruction due to their disobedience to God. They had turned away from him, worshipped idols, and prioritized their selfish desires over caring for the poor and the marginalized. Today, Many countries around the world are facing similar pressures to those experienced by the people of Judah in Isaiah's time. The ongoing conflict in the Middle East, for instance, has left countless families living in constant despair, uncertain of what their future holds. They face the harsh realities of violence, instability, and displacement with many not knowing whether their children will grow up in peace or continue to suffer under the weight of conflict. In the midst of this turmoil, they wrestle with the choice between living in despair or holding on to the hope of a better, more peaceful future. On behalf of the Life and Mission Agency of the Presbyterian Church in Canada, Reverend Christian Persaud visited Palestine and spent seven days engaging in conversations with Palestinian Christians, leaders from both churches and civil society, Palestinian non-governmental organizations, as well as Israeli human rights and Jewish religious groups. All parties expressed a deep desire for peace and sought ways for Palestinians and Israelis to live together peacefully in the land. In our own lives, we also go through seasons of deep despair. Challenges like unemployment, financial struggles, and harmful influence can break families apart leaving us overwhelmed by fear and anxiety. Some of us face the loss of loved ones or health issues that change our lives drastically. These difficulties often make us feel helpless as the life we once knew slips away. And we find ourselves questioning 
if hope is still possible amid such brokenness. While peace may not come overnight to places where people live in fear and terror, we know that God is indeed on the move. God, you see, is not static. God's salvation is marked by transformation, renewal, and new life. Just look at creation. Isaiah proclaims that water will gush forth in the wilderness. Streams will flow in the desert. The burning sand will become a pool. And thirsty ground will turn into bubbling springs. The people of Israel can attest to this. God saw and heard their suffering in Egypt, and he was on the move, leading them out of slavery to the promised land. From despair to hope, God guided them forward, showing his power to renew and restore. Yes, friends, God is on the move. Michael Chan says, the good news is that the God of Jacob does not abandon God's people to their despair. Their sorrow will come to an end, and on a day when the sick body will find new life in God. Let us read from Isaiah chapter 35, verse 10. And the ransom of the Lord will return. They will enter Zion with singing, Everlasting joy will crown their heads. Gladness and joy will overtake them, and sorrow and sighing will flee away. So friends, this reminds us that even though their suffering is real, God promises healing and joy. Weakness, fear, and pain will be replaced with gladness and hope. <clears throat> God is always working to bring new life and joy to his people, no matter the struggles they face. Yes, Jesus is always on the move, stepping outside of his comfort zone and going where he is needed. He doesn't stay in one village, but travels to reach people in different places. In Mark's gospel, our reading this morning, we see this clearly. In verse 24, it says, from there he set out and went away to the region of Tyre. Then in verse 31, it continues, then he returned from the region of Tyre and went by the way of Sidon towards the Sea of Galilee in the region of Decapolis. These verses shows Jesus' willingness to go beyond familiar boundaries bringing his message of love and healing to those who need it most. Jesus may have been looking for some quiet place when he entered the house, hoping to escape the crowd. But as he was soon approached by a woman whose daughter had an unclean spirit, we know the daughter wasn't with her as the woman came alone and bowed at Jesus' feet. In the first century Middle Eastern context, this was surprising. She was, yes, a Syrophoenician, a Gentile, and it was uncommon for a Jewish man, especially a rabbi, to speak with a woman in public, let alone a Gentile. Yet Jesus listened to her and healed her daughter showing that his love and mission go beyond social and cultural barriers. Even though Jesus initially seemed reluctant to grant her request, his mission being first to bring salvation to the people of Israel, we are left wondering if he was testing her faith to see if her persistence would pay off. The woman fell at his feet, acknowledging that she believed Jesus could heal her daughter, whose life was locked in despair, unable to socialize with her peers or experience joy. Can we hear her desperation? She stood before God himself, 
knowing he had the power to cast out the evil spirit. Her humble reply, even the dogs under the table eat the children's leftovers, reflected her faith and desperation. Like the woman who gave everything she had into the offering box in Mark chapter 12, this mother poured out her heart, trusting in Jesus' power to bring healing and hope. Jesus' ministry is one of transformation from despair to hope, from death to life, from separation to inclusion. Then Jesus said to her, you may go. The demon has left your daughter and she went home, found the child lying on the bed and the demon gone. Jesus traveled through Decapolis, a region of 10 cities with a strong Greek and Roman influence located along the eastern side of the Jordan River. Jesus' ministry is to spread God's kingdom and salvation to all people, not just to the Jewish community, but also to those of different races, cultures, and social economic statuses. It includes everyone, even those who are ostracized because of sickness, blindness, or leprosy. In Jesus' time, being blind, deaf, and mute was a difficult reality marked by social stigma and isolation. Many believe these conditions were caused by personal sin or inherited guilt seen as divine punishment. As a result, people with such disabilities were often left out of social gatherings and family events. They had little chance for decent work, relying on begging or small tasks to survive. This isolation left them trapped in despair, dealing not only with their physical challenges, but also the deaf and mute was a difficult reality. Many believe they had little chance of decent work. In this story, friends, it may have been the blind man's own family who brought him to Jesus pleading to him to lay his hand on him. Once trapped in a life of despair and isolation, the man was now set free by Jesus' healing power. Jesus restored him, enabling him to live fully, participating in all aspects of life, including worship at the temple, something previously out of reach. As Jesus looked up to heaven and said, Ephatha, which means be opened. The man's ears were open, his tongue was released, and he began to speak plainly. This miraculous moment transformed his life, freeing him from the limitations that had once bound him. Despair into hope. As we meditate on God's word in scripture, we recognize that God meets us, especially in those moments when our lives feel dry and lifeless. Like a stream in the desert, God brings renewal and hope when we need it most. Let us join the psalmist in praising God for the gift of life and resist turning to worldly promises that cannot offer life-giving water we seek. Many of us have experienced, yes, God's transforming power at various stages of our lives. As followers of the good news of Jesus Christ, we are called to be his hands and his feet, bringing hope and transformation to those who lack resources or are marginalized, those who are often excluded from full participation in our community. So I leave you with the true witness of how God transformed a young woman from hopelessness, 
from despair to hope, from isolation to community. You can find this article on the, on the raw carrot celebrating its 10th anniversary in the fall edition of the Presbyterian Connection on page 16. Janice, a retired site manager, shared her touching story of starting a site to provide a job for her daughter. She says this, when my daughter started working at the raw carrot, she had been unemployed for several years. She was struggling to find the correct treatment for her mental health issues and was completely unable to work in a traditional workplace. She was unhappy, bored, hearing Colleen Graham, who is one of the founders of the Raw Carrot, talk about supported employment for people living with disability was literally an answer to her prayer. She continues to say that over the past seven plus years, her daughter has worked steadily at the raw carrot and has picked up other part-time employment too. Supported employment has been the key to success at the raw carrot. Her daughter today feels successful and needed and productive. Now she can use those skills that she acquired at the raw carrot and do other jobs like house cleaning, gardening, and dog walking. She, had made, she has made friends with other volunteers and other employees. Employment with purpose is a huge part of having a life with purpose. Now she takes piano lessons, has joined the local green team, taken part in Toastmasters, and also has a plot at the community garden. Joined a self-help recovery group and been part of a theater, theater theoretical production. Her life is full and rich. A big part of this change has to do with the ministry of the raw carrot despair into hope, isolation into community. So friends, let us bring the words of Isaiah to those we encounter whose hearts are burdened and who feel overwhelmed by despair in their current circumstances. We can encourage them with the message, be strong, do not fear, your God will come. And for ourselves, let us hold on to God's promise, knowing that he moves, he moves us all from despair to hope. Amen. Let us join our voices singing our hymn, O oh, for a World, hymn 730. <clears throat>
please be seated. <clears throat> Let us pray. O oh God, in whom we live and move and have our being, we come to you in prayer as the summer season draws nearer to its close. We give you thanks for the occasions we have enjoyed to catch up with family and friends, to travel for recreation and restoration, and let our worries go. We are grateful for each moment to savor the beauty of creation. Refresh us for the season ahead, we pray, and renew our commitment to serve you. Loving God, Jesus faced many demands wherever he went and pressures from critics wherever he did, whatever he did. We pray for all those who have not found rest this summer, for those whose work is stressful, exhausting, or unappreciated, and for those whose livelihoods remain uncertain because of circumstances beyond their control. We pray for those with hard choices to make about work or school or what comes next, about relationships and priorities, or about social policies and community leadership. May each one know your strength and guidance day by day. Today, we remember those from whom this summer has been touched by suffering. We pray for those who have lost loved ones and those facing an uncertain future or a, diff a difficult diagnosis. We pray for those who have lost their homes for whatever reason and for those who despair about the climate crisis and what can be done to repair the suffering earth. We pray for all those who join efforts to relieve suffering of any kind. May each one find courage to face tomorrow in your company. <clears throat> Loving God, we need the embrace of your presence each in our own way. As we prepare to leave this service, walk with us and show us how to live each day as those who follow you. Strengthen us to be your hands and feet in the world, bringing hope where there is despair, light where there is darkness, and peace where there is conflict. Guide us by your spirit as we seek to live out your will. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. As we gather in gratitude for God's abundant blessing, let us remember that everything we have comes, it comes from the Lord. We are called to be stewards of these gifts, using them to further God's work in the world. With hearts full of thanksgiving, let us offer our tithes and offerings that they may be used to spread love, bring justice, and reflect God's grace in our community. Let us now stand for the doxology. <clears throat> Let us pray. Generous God, you call us to reach out to those in need in kindness rather than judgment and with generosity, not just good intentions. Bless our gifts and our actions for Christ's sake so that our faith in his love will show in the work of the church that bears his name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let us join our voices singing our concluding hymn. Amazing Grace, 670. <clears throat>
As you go, let us be the hands and feet of Christ, serving others with compassion, speaking truth with love, and walking humbly in faith. May your lives reflect the hope and peace that only God can give. And now, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace now and forevermore. Amen. <laughs>